a race car brain with bicycle brakes. Okay. Your brain tends to run away with you uh, and you don't have the power to control it. So you often feel that your mind is not under your control. It's racing like a Ferrari. And, and our job is to help you gain control, strengthen your brakes. So a Ferrari engine for a brain, for an imagination with weak brakes, but those brakes are strengthenable, which is the really good news that this condition can be modified so it becomes a real asset. And that's what we'd like people to take away. Don't be afraid of this condition, embrace it. If you embrace it and learn about it and learn there's so much more to strengthening brakes than taking medication, then you can stand a very good chance of turning it into a superpower and, and changing it from being an impediment to a real asset. Uh, there are many people who attribute their extraordinary success to the idea, to the fact that they come up with ideas out of nowhere. And that's what people with ADHD do. We come up with, that's the good side of impulsivity, which is one of the hallmark symptoms. What is creativity but impulsivity going right? You don't plan to have a creative idea. They pop, they come impulsively. So if you're not a little bit impulsive, you're not gonna be creative. But a, a nutshell definition that is in fact neurologically very accurate and really contains most of what's going on is a Ferrari engine for a brain, a race car for a brain with brakes that aren't strong enough to control it. Thank you. What, what led us to write the book was the emerging science, the emerging understanding, our continuing learning from our patients uh, and realizing that uh, there's other ways to understand what's going on uh, and, and our need to try and detoxify the ADHD diagnosis um, so that we can make it palatable and for, for everyone and understandable. And I think that's what led us to write this book. So, so this is in no way a synthesis of Driven to Distraction and Delivered from Distraction. It's an entirely new and fresh look at ADHD. Now, of course, some things, some themes run through them all because ADHD hasn't changed. But the, the information we presented and the and the uh, the framework we used was completely new. In in fact, renaming it VAST, Variable Attention Stimulus Trait, that's new. That didn't appear in any of our previous books. Yeah, you know, and like any ADD person, you know, they're they're in. We were interested in the novel that was coming up, and informing our understanding of ADD and. Uh, uh, and, and the way we work with patients. So, you know, we have new chapters that have nothing to do with the past. Thank you so much for explaining that because it did feel so groundbreaking and so new. So that was where my curiosity came from. Like, where does this come from? Here's another concept that you have that is just gorgeous. What is vitamin C? Gentlemen, what is vitamin C? Well, I, I coined this term many years ago, um, really going back to my training at Mass Mental Health Center where John was my chief resident. And the cornerstone of all the work we did with patients was the notion of connecting with them. Uh, that, that that was the most powerful therapeutic tool we had was our ability to connect with them, to empathize with them, tune into them, uh, put ourselves in their position. So, you know, but the, the ability to connect with another person is tremendously undervalued. And, and I thank God that it was the primary value in my training promulgated by John. Unlike most people's training, which is all about memorized syndromes and molecules and pathways and data and, you know, that, that's the name of the game these days, diagnose, medicate, explain, neuropathways, which are wonderful. But that, what gets lost in that is what is demonstrably the most important force in life for pretty much everything that's good, which is the force of connection. Mm -hmm. And to the contrary, what, what drives most of what's bad in life is the force of disconnection. And 
were discovering that the hard way during the pandemic with enforced isolation. So I coined this term vitamins, the other vitamin C, vitamin connect. And it is more essential for life than, than ascorbic acid. And the, the, the fact is social isolation is as bad for you as cigarette smoking. And, and um, uh, we don't push it nearly enough. If we pushed connection um, and exercise um, as much as we push Prozac and you know, Zoloft, uh, people would be served a lot better. So what are some ways that you can uh, advise uh, parents of kids with ADHD? I find that often the kids want to connect but don't know how to. And then they get upset because they are, it, you know, sometimes they are isolated or ostracized or something. What advice can you give parents in that respect? Well, you, 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 you model it at home. Uh, you model it at home with family dinner. A family dinner should be like church. I mean, I happen to go to church, so I take it seriously. Some people don't take it seriously at all, so it's a bad analogy. But family dinner should be extremely important. And if, if you can't do family dinner, do family get breakfast. But a daily gathering of the entire family where you interact with one another, including people you may be very angry at at the time, that should be of tremendous importance. And then, and then uh, uh, other ways of, of interacting, learning how to connect, playing together, uh, being together, picnics, get, get, out, get outdoors, uh, um, you know, and for some children, this is not easy. And, and then when they get to school where it becomes suddenly you've got to interact with strangers, for some kids, it becomes extremely difficult and threatening and brings out their aggressive impulses or their fearful impulses. And that's where social coaching can really help you. Uh, learning how to interact socially is as teachable as reading, you know, and, and now we have therapists who specialize in that. So don't think all is lost if your kid is naturally socially awkward or inhibited or aggressive. Um, lots of kids are, and particularly in today's world where we don't have as much vitamin C as, as we need. So, so the sooner you can supply that, the better. The sooner you can exercise those social muscles, the better. And don't think that everyone has to be hail fellow well met. You can be a very well adjusted, happy, fulfilled, shy human being. What's toxic is loneliness. That's what's toxic. If you right, feel right, bad right. being alone, that's what's toxic. So you want to watch out for that and then intervene with the kid who feels lonely, ashamed, isolated. That's where you want to intervene. Part of my uh, uh, checklist on why I'm optimistic these days is that their education system is switching more towards the social emotional learning piece. It's, it's, a, it's a big move uh, with the people at the top, which is really what we're talking about, teaching our kids to, to work together, to learn together, to connect, basically. And, you know, it started when, I, th I think when my, my kids were in school, when they were first, you know, we used to sit in line, right? And then they got these tables and, and the tables were great, you know, but then we had to learn how to use those tables, you know, in, in first grade and all. But, uh, and now it's teamwork, you know, there's a big emphasis on that, which I think the schools are, are working at and and those kids that can't you know need extra attention to, to help them learn how to do it all right there are several absolutely wonderful insights that you have and one of the most interesting is what happens with that leaky gate between the task positive network and the default mode network and will you please expand upon that because it's it's groundbreaking Sure, uh, I'll start. Well, it's the, the, the issue is, is that we have all these different networks. The way we understand the brain today is thinking about it in terms of networks rather than stations or rather than uh, one, one area. Uh, not, uh, they're all connected. The, these networks are interconnected. And so then it started with really uh, the default mode network in the two, 2004, 2006, when we threw people into scanners, the FMR scanners, and there was always this one 
particular network that lit up because they were told to think of nothing, just let your mind wander. And that was, that's the default mode network. And then they began to say, hey, this is the way the brain is really organized. And then it's generated a whole new neuroscience <clears throat> deal. So then, then a, a, another big one is a task performance network. Um, and that's when you're trying to do something or paying attention to something or thinking about something, not just letting your mind wander. And these are uh, work together and opposite. Uh, the, it, when in the normal quote, whatever that is, the normal person, um, when they're in the task performance network, the default mode, default mode network shuts up. As one person who talks about the default mode said, it's a chatterbox. It's always saying blah, 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 blah. It's trying to interrupt. But when you're focused in the, in the test performance network, <clears throat> in the normal situation, you, you, that, that, that default mode shuts up. With the ADD person, it doesn't shut up. And, and so it acts as a magnet, I think, pulling you away from the task at hand. And this is the big struggle that ADD people well recognized when we explain it to them with that in mind and it's very helpful because then they see what's going on and uh, and, and so forth so it's a, it's a it's a very big change i think in the way we understand it and practically speaking when you're when you're in the when you're in the task positive now i call it task positive jack john says task performance they're the same thing but when you're in the task positive network, your your imagination is engaged with the task, whatever it might happen to be that you're doing, writing a book, uh, making a souffle, you know, stirring up a pot of uh, pasta bolognese. But when when the when the recipe is finished, when it's cooked, uh, and the TPN shuts down, and then this default mode network lights up which I call the demon, the DMN, for the following reason, it tends to send out a, a stream of negative messages, a stream of uh, you suck, life sucks, everything sucks, nothing's gonna work out, we're going to hell in a handbasket, there's no hope, uh, all of your, why do you even bother to try, you're just such a loser, you're you know, nothing, you're stupid, ugly, and boring. It just sends out this terrible stream of, of negativity. And, and what happens is it's very seductive. And, that, and that's because, and remember, we're always looking for stimulation. Uh, contentment is too bland. You don't say she was riveted in contentment, but you do say she was riveted in self-hatred, fear, loathing, anxiety, misery, gloom, and doom. That's gripping, absolutely gripping. It's horrible, but it's gripping. And so the trick is that it's very, it's very simple, but it's very hard to learn because it's breaking a habit the habit of, of entertaining negative thoughts. You have to shut off the DMN's oxygen supply, which is your attention. You have to redirect your attention. You have to pay attention to something else, anything else. If you're all alone in the middle of the night, focus on your breathing, but make it, make it a complicated enough pattern of breathing that it, it will engage your imagination. It's all about engaging your imagination with something other than this stream of negative thoughts, images, and feelings. And, and, and it's, it sounds so simple, but it is very hard to do because most of us with ADD are in the habit of entertaining and, and, and allowing ourselves to feed the demon, to let this stream of negativity just gush all over us. And just, it, it's terrible, it's toxic, it's bad for self-esteem and confidence and hope and trying new things and, and all of that. So the message is don't feed the demon, don't feed the demon. And what you feed it with, what you feed it with is your attention. So to, to starve it, what you need to do is learn how, and it ain't easy, to redirect your imagination to some other task, activity, event that will engage it and shut down the DMN. And, and while you're talking about the neurology though, what I find interesting as a mother of a, of a person with ADHD is that there are those times when he is so completely absorbed um, in, in a particular uh, topic um, where there could, he becomes such an expert 
in something. And then it would seem to me that that's almost the opposite of what you're talking about, that he becomes so involved that this demon part doesn't even seem to exist. Can could you explain some of that? It seems like it's a dichotomy, really. Well, well no. there, it's, it's the same it's the same faculty, which is your imagination, okay? And when you're engaged in a task, your imagination is engaged productively, creatively, uh, wrapped. You know, you go into the state that uh, some people call flow, where you're you become one with the task, and you're the building could be burning down, and you're 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 not going to go anywhere. You're absolutely merged with what you're doing. It's when the when your imagination disengages from that task that the DMN gets its chance to take over. It's still your imagination, but what it's doing is is horrible as opposed to being constructive. Uh, the reason why this is such a, an important groundbreaking finding is what it gives to people who are suffering with ADHD. All of my clients say to me, why is it that when I'm doing something, I have these terrible feelings, these terrible thoughts, what is happening? And so this groundbreaking research that you are bringing to the fore is so helpful to them. I say, oh, you have a leaky gate essentially, and it's flooding in. And Dr. Hallowell and Dr. Rady say, get out of it. You know, neurons that fire together, wire together, move out of that thought, engage your body, do ha breathing, put on some music and dance, and then get back to the task pot like that. It's so hopeful that you can retrain by recognition, right? In, in, in the theory that knowledge is power, you within this one chapter and all the chapters give so much uh, knowledge. Uh, the one remark of your uh, patient, Dr. Hallowell, that it's an attention deficit distorter. Yeah. You know, how much of, you know, I don't know about you, Lisa, but I know for my own children and for my own clients, there's that automaticity of I'm bad, I'm terrible. Like they, they look only at the negative and don't see the positive. And being able to reframe and, and to hold on to that attachment to, yeah, you are good. You have plenty of things that you're really good at, right? No, but we're, we're, we're drawn to those things that are threatening to us. So the bad, what we've had screwed up in the past, you know, that those are some things that we, we, we go to and we get stuck in it. And then you get into the rumination, which is another whole network. And you have to learn to break that rumination. Right. And you, you break that rumination by doing something different. Yeah. My, uh, Ned had a patient who said, Ned said, fry an egg. So they, then the guy called him up uh, weeks later and said, I've, thrown, I've fried so many eggs, what am I to do? You know? <laughs> or dig a hole and uh, my backyard is full of holes. Now, now what do I do? You know, I mean, it's it's like, it, it's something that you have to learn to master. And and by the way, helping you master that, I mean, it's, we talk about, you talk about the, uh, the glitch, we call it the glitzy switch, the switch between the d default mode and the task performance or task positive network. <clears throat> and it gets stuck, you know, and and so to to smooth that out, there are three ways of doing that, or many ways, but three ways in particular: medication, meditation, and movement, exercise. They help facilitate better, uh, you know, better communication between these two key networks in our brain. So it it becomes smoother and easier and so then when you get into some something where you're really focused on you're not going to be driven back to that blah 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 that chatterbox that's full of you know uh, you couldn't do this you can't do that but you know and so you can stay with it it's just wonderful okay now again for this new and this you know the fact that this book is so groundbreaking uh, would you please talk about the cerebellum connection? Because it's so fascinating and, again, so new and gives you so much. You know, what's so great about the book is like, okay, here's what we're noticing. But then guess what, everybody? Here's what you can do. 
it's so pragmatic. All right, so would you talk about the cerebellum connection? John, who do you want to go first on this? No, one? You go ahead. I like to follow you. <laughs> okay. Well, when John and I were in medical school 700 years ago, um, we were we were taught the the cerebellum, which is this little kumquat sh shaped uh, clump of neurons at the base and bottom and back of the brain. It sits on top of the spinal column, and cerebellum literally means little brain. And and we were taught that this little brain, uh, you know, wasn't all that important. It was it, its main role was to regulate balance, coordination. And what's called automaticity, when you can, you know, play a piano piece without looking at your fingers, and it's it's automatic, and and we knew that. Uh, well, along comes uh, brain scans and all the magic we can now do, and one fellow by the name of Jeremy Schmaman, S C H M A H M A N N, at Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital, neurologist, uh, really pioneered the cerebellum and, and its expanded role. First of all, most doctors don't even know this. Uh, while the cerebellum only occupies 10% of brain volume, it, it has 70% of the neurons in the brain. So it is way packed, this, this, this little kumquat thing. And, and Schmaman showed that it is richly connected to the parts of the brain that in that are involved in higher what we call higher cortical function uh, thinking planning regulating deciding prioritizing envisioning you know imagining all that the cerebellum is very involved and we thought it was just this afterthought literally at the back no 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 it is active it's like a quarterback sitting back there behind the line of scrimmage you know sending sending information and uh, regulation and all this kind of, so it is, and, and we prove this by, first of all, if you injure your cerebellum through trauma or infection or surgery, uh, you can get a syndrome that looks exactly like ADHD and it's called Schmaman syndrome. And contrary wise, if you stimulate the cerebellum through physical exercises that challenge balance, like standing on one leg, standing on one leg with your eyes closed, standing on a wobble board, or doing uh, sports that draw upon balance, skiing, skateboarding, you can get dramatic improvement in the symptoms of ADHD as well as dyslexia. So, this, so stimulating the cerebellum becomes a, a nascent uh, and, and we think really very promising non-medical uh, treatment. It doesn't have the prospective double-blind studies that we need yet, but there is one fellow in England, Winford Dorr, who's been doing it for 20 years and getting great results. So th this is this is John and I think uh, one of the really exciting applications of a, a specialized form of exercise to treating both ADHD and dyslexia, for that matter. That's what an amazing idea. That, that, that reminds me of when, when my son was little, he's 29 years old. I, I recall that there were parents who used to give their kids coffee in the morning, like caffeine. Is that is it the same principle trying to stimulate, you know? No, 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 no. Coffee is a stimulant medication, yeah, but which I'm drinking right now. No, this is stimulating a region of the brain, stimulating the cerebellum, this region of the back of the brain that is intimately involved in balance. So by challenging balance, you're getting the cerebellum to feed into the, the front parts of the brain where all the important stuff happens and bring about positive change in the symptoms that relate to ADHD, executive function, um, control over impulses, thoughts, and feelings. And it's, by the way, this is a big area in neuroscience these days in terms of practical neuroscience that you can use in general. Use, uh, getting your cerebellum working better does a lot more than just attention, which it really does, but it affects mood. It affects your ability to use words, uh, concepts, all, all the stuff that, that we think of as higher uh, brain functions. But it has so much, uh, it, it, the cerebellum, as it does for, for our motor system, to keep everything smooth and operating and seamless, 
The same thing happens with our higher brain functions, that we need the cerebellum working well because it's constantly going and correcting and uncorrecting and, and changing and shifting. It's always working. It's the most active part of the brain, really. Even when you're asleep, it's going like it's going crazy. So, uh, you know, to keep you to keep everything regulated and the same thing with all of our brain functions, but certainly with our attention. And, uh, and you know, th this is one area where, in fact, coffee and the stimulants do work, but they work all kinds of places, not just in the cerebellum. I had one patient who was having all kinds of trouble uh, uh, in organic chemistry until he, uh, just by accident, discovered that if he went surfing before the class, okay. he, he did much better. And, and surfing, of course, is a, is a major strain upon balance. And, and so, you know, he just, as, as so often happens, he just serendipitously discovered that challenging balance in the form of going surfing uh, allowed him to, uh, you know, get an A in organic chemistry. That, that's brilliant. Uh, and, and just to add to that, you know, what we do with our kids when they're, you know, all pent up, we put them on the trampoline. Yes. And again, it's vestibular yes. and it's and it's movement and it's balance. And it also has the up and down eye motion. <clears throat> and of course, you know, the intervention of exercise has been, you know, this is so important, Dr. Rabies. Um, right. um, you know, clear cut emphasis on exercise as a absolute uh, baseline intervention for ADHD. Mm -hmm. It is sure. my, my son has a desk job now and what and I watch him because of course we're all home because of the pandemic but he'll get up he'll bounce up and down for a while you know like jump up and down do some jumping jacks do a little jogging around the house and then he can go back and concentrate for a while yeah. then he goes back and sits down <laughs> yeah and, and he's getting a, a whole lot of activity in his brain including the cerebellum you know and like one of the big uh, you mentioned that the the trampoline the mini tramps are the urban rebounders are really good uh, assist for kids and adults with ADD to use to get their attention back on track. So that just to do five minutes or three minutes even of bouncing up and down because you get a lot of, uh, you get a lot of movement in your brain, but certainly in your cerebellum because it has so much of a part to play with our attention and with uh, managing, uh, like your your son bouncing around, even jumping jacks, that takes a lot of cerebellum. Yeah, it, 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 you know, it really does. Uh, you and know, then if you want to make any, if you want to make any of these exercises more challenging for your cerebellum, close your eyes when yes, you're doing yes. it. Wow! Wow. Um, will you talk a little bit about the schools that you work with that uh, move? from time out to time in. Right. Well, that's that's just what your 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 son was talking about, you know, or doing. He took a time out, you know, and instead of just getting more confused and more frustrated with what he was doing and over over taxing his attention, he took a time a time in, which is exercise rather than um, you know, sitting quietly, uh, which you know, in, in the classroom, <clears throat> you get these, you get our ADD kids, you know, they're bored and they're moving around and they get called out and they get time out. Well, the, the years ago, a, a wise principal in Colorado said, well, he's going to do time in. So he got an, an old bike and put it outside in a closet and had the kids when they were acting up to go in there and spend five minutes on the exercise bike and come back. And they were, they were, you know, they were wanting to be citizens of the classroom as opposed to being a jerk, you know, which is, you know, the, it, it, it works like that. And, and that's where the urban rebounder, why I mentioned that, because some schools have it right outside the door. So when they're, when the ADD child or the whatever child is acting up, they have them go out and do three minutes of jumping up and down because it, stimulates the brain, it turns the brain on, it, it makes the, the executive function areas say, okay, you don't need to be so obstreperous. You don't need to make a big deal of yourself. You know, you're, you're okay. 
and and as well that so that it improves the attention quite quite uh, quickly. Yeah, it's just wonderful. You know, you guys uh, at the outset said vast real quick. Would you please describe vast, how you came to that, um, you know, where the genesis of vast and then what, what does that new description lead us and, uh, you know, in the community of ADHD and having people understand ADHD? Well, when I was giving a, a seminar on Cape Cod, oh, it must be five years ago now, uh, we were batting around in the seminar, you know, first of all, how bad ADHD is as a term. It's not a deficit of attention that we have. It's an abundance of attention and our challenge is to control it. And it's not a disorder. It's a trait. If you manage it right, it's an asset. If you don't, it's a terrible liability. So we, the class was, you know, we were coming up with all manner of different terms. And one woman who was a, at that time, a uh, science writer for KQED in, in San Francisco, uh, Carrie Feibel, uh, proposed variable attention stimulus trait, VAST. And we just thought that was wonderful. And because it, 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 it hones in on the, on the two most prominent issues, attention and stimulation, the search for stimulation, and the key adjective variable, because we're nothing if not variable, inconstant, inconsistent, changing all the time. So variable attention stimulus, and then close the deal with trait, not disorder. It's a trait, not a disorder and get rid of. Now, believe me, we're not saying it can't become a disorder. It sure can, it can ruin your life. You know, Russ Barkley's research has shown it lops some 13 years off the average person's life. So it's right up there with, cigarette smoking in terms of bad things that it can do. But what, what we, we haven't called attention to nearly enough is the opposite of that. The number of, of self-made billionaires and Nobel Prize winners and Pulitzer Prize winners and people who are just <clears throat> the innovators, the discoverers, the visionaries, the seers who have this condition. And so, and so trait is, is where it ought to be placed because a lot of people get scared away you know i don't want a mental disorder i don't know i don't have a mental illness i'm you know i, I, I that's not me and and so it, it and it's not just spin doctoring it's it's accuracy attention deficit is is inaccurate so we we uh, uh accepted carrie's gift and uh, uh we now like to call it variable attention stimulus trait and vast because it is vast, and that's another thing most people don't realize, this takes in the entirety of your life, not just your life in the classroom, not just your life, you know, putting things away in your room or cleaning up your desk. It's all of your life, your emotional life, your, your professional life, your personal life, everything you do uh, is impacted by vast. And where's it going to lead? Well, it's already it's already leading in various areas. Uh, just the term vast. A friend of mine in Japan who works with kids uh, is starting a big study with uh, kindergartners uh, and exercise to work on their vast. And he wants to popularize it all through Japan. Uh, that this is one way to to help contain and direct the attention and make it better by you know exercise but it, the, but the point being that he loved it so much that it took the toxicity away from the diagnosis and said this is something we all have and some have it more than others and that's just basically then put everybody on an even plane words really matter and uh, I find that, you know, with people who have that ADHD diagnosis comes a lot of either rejection, I don't have a disorder, there's nothing wrong with me, or when they are performing and they have then the variability in their performance, they get so mad at themselves. But by, right? But you know, we say the only thing consistent is <laughs> line was the only thing consistent about ADHD is inconsistency right? And, and, and embrace it, right? But we still have the disorder label, negative label. By having variability in the, in the naming of it, 
I, I just feel like it takes away the sting. It, it, it has um, empowerment and ownership. So I just, I have great thanks for that. A lot of support groups. I think that's one of the first places perhaps is to, um, but the chat and the, oh, yes. a, 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 what's that? I would say that our chat groups are still very vibrant and, oh. and, and present. Yes, we've had to go into a Zoom mode, uh, but we still are very involved with our communities. And, you know, uh, so yeah, Chad Attitude Magazine is also- Yes, I, I, I would really appreciate Attitude Magazine. It, it's, a, it's really an extraordinarily good magazine. It's a -D 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 -D. We're often asked, yeah, we're often asked for referrals in different areas of the brain and, or different areas of the country. Uh, and I refer them to the Chad groups in the in the area because the moms know uh, who's doing good work. Uh, it, you know, the whole, my whole impetus for starting the Chad group uh, in 2006 was because if you wanted to get a recommendation for a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a speech language therapist for social skills training, you had to go in this like underground network. And a, like a whisper campaign, I was like, okay, there's no no more whispering. Let's bring this above board. And so my first action uh, when I started the chat was I created a directory. It's a wiki document of people that we vetted. And so you know, in terms of people coming to the diagnosis and they're referred to their pediatricians to Chad, um, then whoop, here's the directory. You know. Let's see how we can help you. And we all have monthly support groups, weekly support okay. groups. I, I, I don't think it's uh, off base to say read ADHD 2.0. Yeah. And honest to God, the, the, the final 20 pages of the book are an incredibly complete resource section. And the meat of the book, which is only about 120 pages, contains everything you need to know. So, you know, gosh, we, we, worked hard to create this product we might as well we might as well tell people that's where they should go because i can't think of a better resource that's more current up to date complete and easily digestible than adhd 2.0 can and you they, hold it up can you it, hold up the book so everyone yes, can see it and knows what to look for and so there you go it's available wherever books are sold um what they also it, should they also should follow up with the viewing this uh, interview. Okay, great. And what is the, what do you say to the future? Here we come. <laughs> really, I think the day has come for the ADD tribe to be let loose and, and change the world as we've been doing all along, but now to do it without shame, stigma, and fear. That's a great, great. I would like to say that we move from shame to empowerment. Great. And really, and shine, you know, really just shine. And Lisa, any final words? You know, I just appreciate the positivity. That is the one thing that uh, I would say the hardest when it comes to ADHD, whether you have it yourself or somebody you love or somebody you're working with is, you know, trying to enforce the, the positivity. And as you both said, the superpower. So I really appreciate, I really appreciate that. Dr. Hallowell, Dr. Rady, any Thing you want to add just thank you thank you for having us thank yes you. it was a pleasure talking to everyone on the panel so it's great to talk about something that we're so in love with